Porter's five um, competitive forces for developing strategy. As most of you would know, uh, Michael Porter's credit, credited with um, not exactly inventing strategy, but certainly having a, a huge input in the way that strategy formation is is uh, thought of and, and, and contemplated and even implemented. And and it's a really a key element of, of like I think I mentioned one of my uh, first announcements, I think it's really important to to look at the foundational thinkers of a certain topic, or you're Ogilvy on strategy, I mean, I'm sorry, marketing, uh, people like like that, uh, anything you see, you can read by Steve Jobs or these, these people that have made huge contributions, uh, it, it makes a big difference. And I think uh, Frederick Douglass, for example, but these guys are really brilliant. So I think in this case, Michael... Porter is one of those guys. You, if you're looking at strategy, if you're interested in strategy, then it behooves you to almost compulsory to take a look at his uh, predominant theories, the things that really made him uh, come to the fore in, in this area. So today we'll be looking at that, the five forces analysis. And uh, I think you can, if you, it's in the book, but if you can't find that, this is one is so common that you'll be able to find that reading um, in, in other places as well. Um, we'll go over that just a, a bit. What, what, uh, and, and I've got a few slides for that. And I, I have a longer slide presentation I'll publish so you can look at the other slides, I'll outline it a bit more, but we'll just look at a few here. Uh, first of all, the, the five forces are, are uh, basically, you've read them, you've seen them in, in the reading, but they're, they, they're really a competitive forces, which in the title, of course, but a lot of Michael Porter's writing is based on the competition, on what, uh, what the comp competitors are doing, how, how a company stacks up against competition, what to do to, to fend off or beat or overcome or eliminate competition. So that's where you're, you're coming from when you, when you see his uh, way of approaching strategy. Now let's look at these. First of all, there's a threat of new entry. So in this case, you're, his point is that what are the, uh, you know, people coming into where your, your, your space, what are, what are, what, are, what keeps them from doing that? And, and it, the typical things are like the time and cost of entry, uh, the specialist knowledge that you have to have, economies of scale, like, you know, just create a new airline builder, you're competing with Boeing and Airbus, it's just, you know, not really feasible. Uh, there's certain cost advantages, technology protection, and and other barriers to entry, which could be even uh, government political things. It, it, you know, you see when you look at um, multinational corporate strategy, one of the things they really have to deal with is, is what, you know, if you want to move into a certain country, what is that country doing to block uh, and entrance and protect their own industries or in other way, in some way um, manage the, the number of, of uh, competitors they have in their market space. Then you have uh, competitive rivalry, which is the, the number of competitors, the quality differences, other differences. These can be things like, you know, of course, price, quality, locations, all sorts of things that factor into this area of, of what the competitors do uh, that, that you need to be aware of. Uh, when we look at some of the other writing, we'll look at a, a kind of competitor analysis to see how you really look at competitors and how you decide uh, to identify them, characterize them, and, and go after them in that way. The switching costs, customer loyalty, a lot of things, you know, you might not like your bank, but it's, it's not easy to go to a different bank. Now, it's easier for us, but say you're uh, a high net worth individual in Latin America and you have a, a banking relationship, to go through all the compliance uh, and other hassles that require you to move from your bank to another one is, is, is quite a lot. So you, you, may not, you may be dissatisfied, but you may not move so quickly. And there's the cost of leaving the market too. Now there's the buying power, buyer power, sorry. So that's really the, that when the buyer in a uh, case has a lot of bargaining or not as much bargaining power. And these are things such as number of customers, the size of each order, uh, difference between com competitors and price sensitivity, ability to substitute and cost of changing. A lot of times the buyers in this case, they have a lot of a power if these things are available to them. If there's a, if they can easily substitute, for example, one product for another, say you want, you really like Nike sneakers, but New Balance comes up with something just the same and it's half as much, you know, the buyer makes those kind of decisions. Uh, on the other hand, you may be so brand conscious, you don't switch. So there's, and, and there, then there are different costs of changing. If you're like a, you know, you might have a, a truck, a 
company a trucking line and all your loaders and, and other types of equipment are, are built to to work on a certain type of, of truck now you want to you may not like that kind of truck anymore or you may want you might want to consider alternatives but it would mean retooling a lot of other things as well so sometimes the the buyer has power sometimes it's less power uh, based on, on on their circumstances then there's a threat of substitution you know what are the substitute performance the cost of change um, and, and, and that is really important uh, in, in, in a lot of the cases. And there may be, um, and it can be, in, in case like you might look at your phone, you, you all are probably holding an iPhone in your hand, um, Samsung may be just as good. Uh, you, you can substitute the performance. You may not want to, but you can. So Apple would have to be aware of that, even though they think well, we've got, we've got uh, Samsung being in a lot of other ways. They, they do have to realize the basic functionality of what they're offering has a substitute. Uh, as a, a potential substitute, you have to be aware of that. You know, in the old days when when camera companies thought they were looking at other cameras, they really didn't realize they were actually looking at a whole change in digital uh, and digital everything, and the power of the internet and the power of digital uh, uh, the digital transformation that overwhelmed that industry. So, it's, so it's not always no easy to see who your substitution is, but they're out there and they have to be uh, analyzed and looked at. Then there's supplier power. And this is from the point of view of the supplier. I, how many are there? What are their size? Uh, you know, what is the uniqueness of the service? Sometimes, as again in foreign countries, you may uh, you may want alternatives, but based on various protective factors or industry size, there are only one or maybe two uh, potential providers of what you're looking for in that country. You have not much choice. So the supplier in that case has a lot of competitive power because you just don't have competitors to to uh, to choose from. So that's those. That's the kind of thing that that affects uh, that. Just senior rating, and it goes on quite a long time. These are it's a summary, but really it is pretty accurately what that whole section is about. Uh, I think that that um, well, we'll look at a, a few comments now on on on, on the applicability of Porter's five forces, which it applies. It's always something you should be looking at. However, what happens is a lot of times. This is an academic approach to to what's happening within industry. It's an industry-wide approach rather than business within industries or a lot of smaller businesses. And then it's a kind of consultant approach. Consultants will always uh, throw this at you. They'll always say, well, we looked at uh, quarters. Yeah, sorry, the video glitched there for a second. Anyway, so yeah, consultants will always uh, you know, toss this at you and they'll, and they, and they'll, and they'll, they'll use this as a, as a way to, to discuss what they're doing, so I think that it's it's a, it's important, but I think that there are a couple of things. One is that it's it's really um, again thinking of the way a consultant looks at things. It's really in the in the kind of assessment analysis uh, descriptive part of what they do, and often it's it's not that um, uh, difficult to take a company that's in an industry and, and a performing either good or bad or me medium, and then you apply these five forces and you kind of describe using them what happened and, I, and it's very accurately uh, it gives a framework for accurately describing uh, why they were successful and successful or, or uh, muddling through uh, based on on these five forces which I think is is a useful assessment uh, and analytical tool but it may be less predictive not that you can't use it for prediction but I think you know it's not as predictive as some other things and you might use it as a predictive way to, to look at the competition Define them according to these five forces, then see where you need to go to to fit in or beat them. Um, so I think it, it has that value, but I, I think there are, there are, it's uh, it's um, it's more along those lines. Now let's look at at this slide, which shows um, where there's some um, you know, criticism or or at least some interesting comments on why Michael Porter's five competitors are less applicable in some cases today. Now. First of all, you have to think about the social era, the social media era, and, and digitalization of everything has changed everything. It's just things are different. So some of the big, uh, when you look at, at Porter's model, one of the big differences that is, is size. Size isn't enough any longer. And it, not only that, it's not a primary determinant of a lot of things. Now, having said that, obviously, uh, with the big guys, the big five, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, and, uh, you know, the other one, um, they, these guys, uh, they, they are huge and they 
and use their size, and they do have the size to either buy, acquire, or push out, or overwhelm um, other companies in their space. But that's not the same as uh, manufacturing companies where you used to be able to use the same type of force based on size to, to uh, handle their competitors. So, you know, once uh, before size gave uh, customers purchasing power, like Sears used to be such a gigantic uh, company and, and they still big, of course. And one thing they always, they just owned their supplier. They were able to, to control the price, the pricing and cost on that way. You can't do that any longer. Um, big used to lead to high barriers and, and um, they keep out potential competitors. It still may, and, and barriers can also be, uh, like I think mentioned in, in, in a, when you're trying to enter foreign markets too, where you know there, there are big barriers there that, that um, uh, used to not be penetrable, but now you can find other ways around those based on, of course, the lowering of, of, of uh, barriers in general, but also through the uh, internet power and ability to purchase things uh, electronically and, and take delivery in different ways. Uh, the capital requirements to get into businesses are less uh, than they used to be. It used to be um, you had to have a lot of money to get going. Now, it's still true in many ways, in many industries, but there are a lot that are, you are able to start and do things. And a lot of you are thinking of startup businesses or becoming entrepreneurs. There are openings, there are ways. You still need seed money, but not nearly like it used to be. Um, that... Again, if you're trying to start an airline and you're competing with Boeing and, and Airbus, that's going to be very difficult. This this model fits perfectly for that, and that that is a huge barrier to entry. That size and the capital requirement there will not let you get into that uh, market very easily. Um, the, the the a main difference is that at, in, in when you look at Michael Porter's uh, his five forces, and when you look at the companies that look at those and the big companies. The customer is sort of at the end of the process, you know, it's down the road. So you have all this going on, and then, oh yeah, and there's the customer too, because it was based on the production side and the other factors, financing, capital formation, expertise, location, production, with the customer uh, reaping the, the reward of all that, but it's, it's way different. Now, of course, the customer has moved much more to the front and, and a lot more able to impact the way um, things work. Uh, for example, I look at uh, the old, remember Michael Porter is writing in the 80s from what he saw from the 50s and onward. Uh, for example, there were only four TV stations in those days, you know, for a lot of that time. And, and they dominated what was going on. There wasn't a lot of other choice. So the customer uh, was happy to have television uh, what, and, and was not able to really uh, force changes there or, or choose from a lot of other things. And, and be at the center of that whole production uh, cycle, which, which certainly are now. Um, now you're looking at, at things that are a little more customer focused, a lot more customer focused, and where and you hear a lot of talk. Maybe it's too much, but I think there's a lot to be said. Where the distinctness, the difference, the the uh, focus on the power of one consumer uh, is, is much more prevalent. And in fact, I think that with the internet and with the constant feedback you're able to give to companies. You're going. To, you will see. You are seeing. We'll see a lot more tweaking as you go along. You'll see uh, you know, constant feedback from customers. Do you like this? The way this T-shirt looks. I like it. The next production line will be different, and then so on. That can't happen with cars. They can't change so fast. But so many things. The production side can be tweaked and, and changed. And, and of course, that'll be much, you know with uh, digital printing, etc. Things will be more and more along that line where constant feedback from customers will shape and affect the the way things are done. So it's uh, a lot of these massive barriers to doing things and, and, and slowness to change will be eliminated through technology and through feedback uh, for many, many industries. Um, so I think that that if you look at, and in summary, you, you, I think that, again, uh, the Michael Porter's work is, is seminal, it, it's foundational, it's, it, uh, it started the conversation, and, and you should know it. And I think it's very useful. It's very useful for analytical, for analyzing things and for for managing, uh, you know, th and also for understanding the way you're going to hear things in school and college and, and also from consultants and that it's good to know this. It's good to have this in your back pocket. It's good to understand it. And you, and you will certainly be able to use it. However, the, the things are changing and I think that you really need to be focused on how the digital era is, is affecting. Like when you see something like this, where does it stop and start when you have to look at the things on, on nimbleness, on quickness, on low cost entry, on no barriers to entry? Um, 
you know, I look at Barry Sentry. Book publishing used to be one of those things where you had to be big, otherwise you couldn't do it. Now, you know, the books you guys are buying, they're not made before you buy them. They, they, uh, there's no inventory. There's no uh, big stack of books somewhere that if they don't get bought, they won't get, they, you know, they'll be sitting there. No, that's none of that anymore. So there's so many things like that that have changed. And so you, when you look at the at this, you would have to think, now, again, well, almost everything you look at, how is the new economy, the digital world, how has that changed this fundamental way we look at, at the strategy? Um, please let me know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, thank you for the attention and uh, talk to you soon.